What's up, guys? It's your boys, Wolke, back with another reaction to the Chris Watts, well, actually, the Chris Watts murders, but the involvement of Nicole Kissin Kissinger, okay? Now, with that being said, we have been watching a lot of stuff, not re or just recently, about the hauntings that possibly are taking place inside the home, which a lot of stuff has arised and come up. Uh, through the years um, since the, the murders back in 2018. Now, a lot of people, like myself, think that Nicole is was more part in than what we believed. Now, with all this information, there was uh, her interview, apparently it was like four hours long, that recently sur surfaced not too long ago, roughly just short of a year ago, and I just recently started watching it. And holy crap, there's tons to watch of why Nicole was involved more than we believe. But before we go any further, what I want you guys to do is subscribe to more content when it comes to Channels of Wolke. There's everything nerdy and more. So make sure you guys are subscribing by hitting that wiper icon. Hit the bell icon next to it so when I do post videos like this one, you'll get that little ring notification that I've posted that video. And then you guys can watch, comment, like, and share. And the reason why I continuously want to find out about the Chris Watts murders is one, it pisses me off that this guy is still alive. Um, because he murdered his two daughters, Bella and Cece, beautiful little girls. His wife, which she was very beautiful. I think, honestly, she was more beautiful than Nicole. Um, it's a mother thing. I don't know what it is. But with that being said, he took the lives of them because he wanted to start a new life with Nicole, which apparently Nicole has mentioned that she did not know about Shanann or Shanann. She knew about Shanann, but... Chris stated that his marriage was over. It was done. It's over with. But little did Nicole know it was far from over. But then there's the other side that a lot of people believe that Nicole Kissin or Kessin or Singer, Kessin Singer. I don't even know how you pronounce her last name. Kessinger. Kessinger. There we go. She knew about the entire time because apparently there was texts and messages back and forth between Chris and Nicole that stated, did you sell the ring or pawn the ring? Why would she know that if Nicole or if Shanann was still alive? Um, or you can't, we can't be together if Shanann is still alive. Or I don't want kids is what she mentioned. That's why he killed his daughters. This pisses me off again because I myself am a father of three, two beautiful daughters and one son. I could never see myself doing this. But this channel called Annie Elsie, Elsie uh, times 10 to life breaks it down of this interrogation that they do with Nicole and all the red flags. And I want to watch it with you guys. So with that being said, um, again, this is non being disrespectful to uh, Shanann and her family, um, the ones that have been grieving since her death. This is for educational purposes. And also, we want to get down to what... I don't think Chris was by himself in these murders. I think he had help with Nicole. He just is trying to save her from damnation into prison life. Um, he did not get the death penalty, unfortunately. Um... I think if you kill that many people or even and an eye for an eye is what I think. Um, child predators, you hurt somebody, you kill somebody. Snip, snip. Um, I, th I think it's wrong. It's degrading. It's nasty. It's revolting. They should not be in prison um, soaking up resources, food and all that stuff. And for him to take his family out like, like he did grotesque and this man needs to be there's a special place in the HG double hockey sticks for him but with that being said let's watch this video and see what more we can find out with chris watts's mer or mistress and do you believe also what i want you guys to do is comment down below do you believe that nicole K kessinger was involved I 100% believe that she was involved. Apparently, she's in the witness protection program. She moved out of Colorado. She's somewhere else um, starting anew. I don't know if she has any kids or anything like that. I should probably look it up, but let's look at the interrogation first before we go any further. So let's take a look. Buddy, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life. 
Dandelion. Where we talk all things true crime. So if you are brand new Ooh, and like checking it. out this video and channel for the first time, welcome. I hope you enjoy it. And for all of my returning Check it out. lifers, welcome back and thank you for your continued support. Today, we are going back to Watts Island. And uh, don't say it. I know before you guys say anything, trust me. I promised myself that I would never go back to Watts Island. I made a vow to myself that I would Same wouldn't. here, pretty much. But some new information has surfaced. There are some things that a lot of you have been requesting that we talk about. You guys have. So we're going back there. And I am making a vow again to myself that this will be the final time we talk about this monster. But there have been, again, as I mentioned, some new developments, a new video released that maybe you have heard about. And a lot of you guys have I did been not requesting know this. that I share my thoughts. So here we are. And it's not about Chris Watts himself. It is about Nicole Kessinger, his mistress. Many of you Kessinger. may have heard about or seen the latest video that was released of Nicole Kessinger's interview with police. Whereas before we only had audio and some of it was just bits and pieces. Yeah, I heard we now a little have bit. video to go along with it. Oh. And it's pretty telling in my opinion. For those who are unfamiliar, not that I think there are many of you who are not familiar with this case. My but parents just didn't in know. Case, Nicole Kessinger was Chris Watts' mistress, and many have suspected for years that she did have some sort of a level of involvement in what happened to Chris's wife, Shanann, Cece, Bella, and their unborn son, Nico. Now, Shanann's family has said on various occasions that they, of course, have more information and more than the, know more than the public knows, absolutely. And they have said that they believe Chris is solely responsible for the murders. Really? I absolutely respect that, and I respect that family and what they have gone exactly. through immensely. My personal opinion is that there are just far too many inconsistencies, mm -hmm. deleted messages, deleted calls, deleted search histories, Amen. and too many shady coincidences for her not to be involved or have some sort of level of insight as to what was going to happen. So today I'm going to be pointing out key inconsistencies, blatant lies, and things that really just don't add up between Nicole's police interview and the fact-based discovery that like we this. went through. I like this. So this video will be fact-based with footage of her interview and with direct information from the 2,000 pages of discovery. Holy I read shiznits. start to finish. It took me several hours. But it was very telling. So I'm. Go it's not going to be all these conspiracy theories in this video. It's not going to be conspiracy it's theory. It's all facts. Driven. And you'll be able to really assess the information yourself and make your determination of her involvement from there, whether she was or wasn't involved. So, guys, let's get into it. Okay. This girl is rolling up her sleeves. With Annie Elise. Starts right now. Okay. On August 16th, 2018, Nicole gives another interview with police. This took place five days after the murders of Chris Watts' family. To me, she seems extremely frustrated or somewhat annoyed at the line of questioning in this interview. And the fact that she has to really be there at all, she just seems agitated by it. Her behavior and attitude doesn't quite strike me as someone who is distraught or wanting to be overly helpful. Her dad also attended this interview with her, and occasionally Why? he would share his opinion She's or advise adult. her when to share hers or not. So rather than go through the entire three and a half hour interview with I you, saw which that. would just take so long, I'm going to break down the key highlights in which okay. I believe are red flags because they don't align with the evidence from the discovery and or because of the statement or behavior behind the statement. Uh, your relationship with Chris and what you know about Chris and his family and... Uh, events relating her to posture nicole said that after meeting chris in june 2018 she didn't know shanann's name right away and that she didn't know it for a while he mentioned that he did have a significant other and then he told me that those two were in the process of a separation did he mention the children's name or his significant other's name um i didn't know his significant other's name for a while now, if this were true, and if she truly didn't know Shanann's name and didn't learn of it until well after meeting Chris and starting their affair, how is it possible that she was searching for Shanann and using her specific name in those searches dating much earlier? Because police found that she had been searching Google for uh, Chris Watts oh. as early as August 3rd, 2017, and searching Shanann Watts back in January 2018. 
Now, originally, there were reports that she was searching Shanann back in 2017 at around the same time that she was searching Chris's name. However, it then was disclosed that it was a typo, but there were proven police search histories that showed that she was searching Shanann in January of 2018. So how can you do that if you didn't learn of her name until over six months later, as you're claiming? Nicole Ooh. then states that she and Chris go on their first date around her birthday to a local park, and this takes place around the end of June, early July. Nicole tells police that right before Father's Day, Chris told her that he had kids, which she apparently thought was really cute, and also he also told her that he was separated from his wife. But here's what's different. On Father's Day, which was June 17th in 2018, okay. so around this time that they went on their first date, Shanann wrote a public tribute on her Facebook to Chris about Father's Day. And we know that Nicole was searching her and watching her Facebook, so she would easily see this and know that they, in fact, are not separating negating her claim that she was under the impression that they were mutually divorcing this entire time. So Nicole then becomes frustrated with the officer asking her these questions, and she actually talks over him, saying that she can't remember details and just becomes frustrated. Um, you know, anything like that, if he ever made any kind of statements that you were like, whoa, that was weird, um, or why would he say that, or why did he mention that? Do you understand what I'm, I'm no, looking I for? No, I completely understand. I just feel like some of this happened so long ago that I can't tell you like the exact words of the exact conversation at the exact time sure. and place because it's like we had a lot of conversations. I mean, we talked every single day. So it's so if like a... I'm trying to help you guys with the stuff like the stuff that's more current. I can give you guys a lot more like detail. And she does look annoyed. You're asking me about something that happened six weeks ago and exactly what was said. It's like, I mean, I'm sure I can give you a general idea, but to be honest with you, like to pinpoint exact words, it's not going to happen. I'm not. Looking for exact words, um, just more, uh, let's say six weeks ago, he said something that triggered with you last night. Um, that's what I'd be looking for, or something four weeks ago. And if you don't remember where it was or the specific words, that doesn't matter. Just he said something that was off the wall, or he said this, or he said that, that has caused you a moment to pause, and you go, wow, I wonder why he said that, now knowing what you know today. Do you understand where, where I'm going with that? In my opinion there, she doesn't seem to be this deer in the headlights, overly concerned like, oh my gosh, that, happened? that she was trying to portray herself as. Then the detective starts to tell Nicole that he does have information that he can't share with her, which is normal, especially in these interviews. Yep. They say, we have a lot more information, but we can't tell you that because we don't want to jeopardize the investigation. And because they want to know if she's going to be forthcoming with the information or not. So he tells her this, that he has this info, but that he can't share it with her. And she gets visibly nervous. She ends up grabbing her water to take a drink as she's nervous. And this is an action that I noticed quite a few times during the course of this interview. Anytime she felt uncomfortable or there was a question or a statement made that made her somewhat nervous, she would grab her bottle of water, hold it, and then take a drink, almost kind of like a tell, personally, in my opinion, but almost as though she was trying to take a second to like think how she was going to react or to like take her mind off of it. It was just very interesting to me. Okay. Although... She's doing short, this. I Just laying everything That's out. That's a nervousness thing. What actually was going on with him. And yep. some... We may... I might ask you a question and you're going, why the heck would he ask me? She's fidgeting a lot. I have information that I'm not willing to share with you, and I'll tell you that right now. I'm not going to tell you. Some questions I'm going to ask you, and you're going, what the heck? I, w I won't share some information with you. Just It protects you, it protects our investigation. So if it seems weird, there's a reason I'm asking it, That's and fine. it's usually relative to what I know. Um, so don't, don't take offense to it. Again, it's just part of what we need to know. Um, Understood. So then they start talking about her phone and collecting the data from that. And she responds in a really weird way, guys. She says, I feel like this situation is crazy, regardless whether I give you my phone or not. And then her dad kind of interrupts and says, well, if you do, it's just going to reiterate everything that you've already said, as though he already knew what was on her phone and perhaps knew what she at this point had already deleted off of her phone. So when he says this, then Nicole responds and says, yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of a good backup. A good backup? I mean, maybe she was meaning it was just going to reinforce what her statement to the detective was, but something about this part of the conversation just doesn't sit right with me. I forgot about that. For TPD. It's not for them. They're doing it for us. Yes. We just didn't, we don't have the equipment with us to do it, and I asked them to do it for us. They're not involved in this investigation. He would just be a uh, computer person. 
he would not be looking at any of this stuff that uh, would fall to myself. So keep that in mind. He's not involved in this investigation. Thornton PD has nothing to do with it. I'm surprised they're letting her touch her phone. And, um, Usually they would put it on the table and tell her not to He's touch not it. Look at she phone could be right deleting now. stuff right He's now. Put it on a disc and they're going to give it to me. I really want to help you guys. I do. I feel like I'm, I'm, this whole thing is just going to be crazy regardless of whether I give you my phone or not. I mean, that's kind of how I look at it. Like, it's happening. It's going to happen. Well, the text the reiterates what you've be been saying all along, so it's not like... Well, they do. That's the other thing, too. I mean, that's kind of a good backup. Yeah. I'll so after she goes back and forth with this detective about back. giving them the phone so that they can go through her photo history, her text history, her call logs, which it took quite a bit of persuading from the detective. Like, it went on for almost 10 minutes. Can't she they get a signs warrant the paper to and get it? To turn it over. And then she tells police that there's nothing else than what is on her phone and that everything is there. Even though at this point, she had deleted so much already. Exactly. Which we're to get to in a little bit. Well, there'll be in that text message thing. So all his photos were sent. There was no apps or anything else you no, used that you no, guys no, were no, sending. No, no. It was all Snapchat, yeah. Instagram. So it'd be an attachment to a text that he sent you. Pretty much. But uh, everything is in the text and the phone call records. Nicole also says that she didn't learn about Shanann's pregnancy until the newspaper reported it and the news aired about Shanann missing and Chris gave that infamous interview. However, computer records from the discovery show that Nicole, again, frequented Shanann's Facebook page, where Shanann not only had Checking made up on her tribute for Father's Day, but she also announced her pregnancy and made frequent updates about her family. So she and knew. All of these posts were public. Prior to turning the tape on, um, on Tuesday, which would have been the 14th of August, um, you had read some newspaper articles on the 13th and the 14th that regarded this case. You had also had a conversation with Chris at some point during the day on Monday. Uh, and on Tuesday, because of what you found, specifically what you said was, and I don't let me put words in your mouth, but you knew, you found out that his um, wife was pregnant. Correct, yes. And you did not know that prior. No. And you found that out via the newspaper articles, and that caused you to be pissed. To well, I just realized that he was lying to me, and I was like, well, if you can lie to me about this, what else can you lie to me about? And it made me realize that maybe his wife was in danger at that point, and it was day two, so you should... She didn't... No, she and didn't think that I was in danger. And that we learn that indicates she knew about the pregnancy, and we'll get into that a little so bit. So she's later. lying, too. Nicole then says that the second day of Shanann being missing is when she decides to stop talking to Chris, saying he was far too casual about the whole thing. I stopped talking to him because I didn't feel good about it, so she tells the detective, on the second day, I cut Chris off. That's why I gave him the benefit of the doubt for the first day. Because I was just like, you know. Like, I didn't even think about that. I mean, murder was not on the top of my mind when somebody doesn't come home for an evening. Especially if they've just, like, had some sort of, like, heated conversation. It's like, okay, you guys are separating a heated conversation. You leave for a night. Like, I didn't even think. I mean, it's true. I killed his wife. I mean, that, that like. Murder is on something on the top of my mind when I call one of my friends for three or four hours and she doesn't answer the phone. Like, that doesn't even process to me as, like, a real thing that is a possibility at that point. And so that's she's why very... I day, and then the second day I was talking to him, he was just... She's looking at the camera. As I could tell. And then with, like, the way he was talking to me, and then that's kind of when I cut him off and I stopped talking to him. But her final call with Chris was actually when she was suspected to have been listening in on a call that he had with detectives, which, again, we'll get into in a bit here when we what? start going through the discovery and the timeline and sequence of events. As the detective is asking Nicole about the seriousness of she and Chris's relationship, Nicole says that she had no intentions of even moving in with Chris and that she made it extremely I heard otherwise. clear to Chris all the time that she wanted to take things very slowly and have separate lives until the time was right. Apartment wasn't for you and him. It was just for him and his children. Oh yeah. It was. You weren't. In, had no intentions of moving I, in with him. No. I have my own spot. I still have a lease there till July, and even then, like he never asked me to move in with him, okay. and I never tried to move in with him. I mean, I told him. I mean, 
I really try to take everything with this whole situation very slow. The only part that I screwed up on was she the keeps looking at the camera. We separated from her when him and I decided to spend time with each other. That is where I screwed up. But other than that, everything else, it was always like, you know, you build your life, I'm going to build my life, we will intertwine them, but I am not ready to, like, do this. And he respected that. And I and I, um, I even said that, and I don't know, I, that might be in the text, but so that two words, like, Chris, like, you need space, like, it's getting out of the divorce. Like, personally, I think jumping into a new relationship is a little quick. It's like, I was in a relationship earlier this year, and I think this is also a little quick. And I'm like, so why don't we take our time? And I'm like, if you guys end up doing a week on, a week off with your kids, I'm like, the week you have your kids, be with your children. And the week that you don't, I'm like, I don't even want to see you every day. I'm like, I think we should spend like a few days of that together. I'm like, because I like my space and I think you need your space. I think you need your space to like develop your identity again and like get it back because I think he's just been like so wrapped up in this whole thing that he's got in his own life and his life that he, I mean, he doesn't remember probably what it's like to like be single or have time where it's like just him. Sure. And so I was just like, you know, like embrace that. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I really try to like, take it smart with all that and it was okay so tell me why you were looking at wedding dresses for over two hours if you wanted to take i heard this slowly. why google if he would marry his mistress which is a google search she did if you wanted to have separate lives and didn't plan on taking the next step it doesn't add up it doesn't nicole says that she didn't talk to chris on the phone at all that day on that tuesday the 14th because she was mad at him and again thought that everything was too weird regarding his behavior and how casually he was acting texting me so much openly and he had friends there that I was like I didn't want them to see that and so I was like trying to get him to slow down and then I told him too like um after he lied to me I was just kind of like I was done and I was trying to find a way to like get away from the situation please stop texting me or panicking him so I told him like everything's all good I'm still here for you and I feel bad because like I lied to him but I mean I like just try to keep him calm and then I told him like contact me once they find your family but what is odd about that is that they talked several times in the early hours of the 14th including when she is suspected to have listened in on that call with Chris and the detective clearly they weren't in a bad place at that point like she was trying to tell this detective mm. So since that was one of the last conversations between the two of them, I'm wondering, did they agree that at that point they would stop communicating because that was the final call between she and Chris? And again, I'll touch on that shortly and how that very well might be the case that they had decided this was going to be the last phone call between them because she also talks about a text message exchange between the two of them and how that ended abruptly. Nicole also told the detective that on that same day, on the 14th, the day after the murder as well, she was at work, she texted Chris to push him to tell her what he knew about the disappearance and she was asking what had been done, really just trying to get answers out of him. So she said that he told her that he would never hurt his family. And she tells the detective, it got to the point where he was telling me so many lies that eventually I told him I didn't want to speak to him again until his family was found or until he came clean. Then she says, that was supposed to be our final text send-off. What does that even mean? Final text send-off. Like it was planned to be their final text exchange. Who says, I was mad at him and I didn't want to talk to him anymore, so that was supposed to be our final sign-off text? It just makes seems no really weird to say. And I think he's aware of the fact that I'm probably about to walk away from him. So I think that was like his way of like saying goodbye. So it didn't really seem strange in the context of what was going on between like the him and I part of stuff. And then, um, and I kept asking him too, like, what did you do, Chris? What did you do? And he was like, I didn't do anything. And I'm like, where's your family? And, like, I asked him that. I don't know if I started doing that on Tuesday or if I started doing that on Monday. But I definitely, I think it was Tuesday. Because I don't really think I was that alarmed on Monday. And then, um, uh, so that was supposed to be, like, our final sign-off text. Then she tells the detective that she needed to bring something up to them that she forgot to tell them previously. She says that the night after everything unfolded in one of their many phone conversations in the early hours of the 14th, 
Chris asked her what to do with the wedding ring that he found. This is what I want to know. And she told him to pawn it. That's what I want to know. What person on the planet would suggest that 24 hours after your family is missing and kids go missing? If she truly thought that this woman and their exactly. children were just missing and would possibly return, why on earth would you suggest to pawn it? Wouldn't you say something like, keep it for when she returns home or give it to the police as evidence, not pawn it, especially if during this entire interview, you're claiming to be so upset and so distraught. That's where it I seems call like BS. a very odd statement to make just less than 24 hours after they are missing. So another thing, so that was Tuesday and that was it for Tuesday, but I forgot some stuff on Monday that I did need to bring up to you guys. So Monday, um, when we were on the phone at one point, he mentioned to me, She left her wedding ring here, and I said something along the he line. He took it off her dead bodies, which she did, he did. What mean to have done? And he was like, he was like, how much do you think it's worth? And I was like, I remember hearing him say that and being like, what the fuck? And I remember thinking to myself, like, I don't even know how to respond to this. And so I was like, I don't know, pawn it, man. And I was just like, I was like, I pawn jewelry all the time. I was like, I pawn jewelry a few times. I was like, it's not worth shit, though. And I was like, so I don't know if you really want to do that. And he's like, no, no. I think I'm going to get it appraised. It's a nice rock. And After an hour of your miss then or your wife being gone. The discovery or about the affair. 24 hours. And she tells the detective that she contacted the police to tell them about the affair because of how weird she was feeling with Chris's behavior. However... This, as a fact, was already after police had been informed about the affair by a supervisor at her workplace, Anna Darko. In the discovery, it is detailed that on the 15th of August, before this interview took place, at 8 a.m., CBI agent Tammy Lee received a phone call from an Anna Darko regional manager, and this manager informed her that they have uncovered evidence that Chris began a relationship with a coworker around June 2018. Two hours after that call was made, at 9.50 a.m., Nicole then contacted detectives regarding her relationship with Chris Watts. And it was stated that she was tipped off that the Anadarko manager had discovered the emails revealing her affair with Chris, which is why she then took the initiative to contact the police because she knew it was going to be exposed. Yep. And it wasn't like she wanted to be forthcoming like she would later suggest to police and share the information to help the case. She knew it was exposed. She knew the manager had the emails and had contacted police. So then she wanted to immediately call them and say, hey, by the way, I'm having an affair with him as though she's doing the right thing, but she wasn't. That same day that her affair was now known by police, she searched for the phrase, can cops trace text messages? How long do phone companies keep text messages? What's the difference between text message content and text message detail? And then she deleted that search. Oh! So you're trying to, again, be forthcoming and give the police intel into your relationship with Chris because you want to share as much information as possible and help them with this investigation. Why would you care if cops can trace your text messages? And even more than that, why would you delete that search the plot and the text thickens. messages that you're so worried about them tracing? She doesn't appear to be as forthcoming as she's trying to portray. Police then asked Nicole about the phone call that was 111 minutes long the night before, technically like the night of before the murder. So it took up. place like right before midnight and then Shanann got home at 2 a.m. And so they talked for approximately 111 minutes. Nicole said that they were facing so just under two hours. And that she can't remember what they talked about. Bull she crap. Said she can't remember anything they talked about for nearly two hours from just a few days earlier. It was literally five days earlier. You don't remember anything about BS. the two-hour FaceTime call you had. But yet she does tell the detective that something did feel off about their conversation. So she conveniently remembers that. And she says what fell off was that Chris was lying on his bare mattress. And she thought that was weird because there were no sheets on it. But seriously, you can't remember anything else. But you remember that something was odd about his That's behavior. the night before. So Maybe. Maybe. But it feels like a coincidence. If that was the night before, she didn't get there until like 4 o'clock in the morning, Shanann. So he had not committed the murders yet. But why would his sheets be off of his bed? 
difference here. It feels like something else. And honestly, it felt like Nicole's father kind of controlled a lot of this interview. He said more than once. She got daddy Chris issues. confesses to this and pleads guilty. Basically, this is the end of the case, right? It's like he knew what to ask or what to say so that Nicole wouldn't be looked into further or get in trouble for anything. And in fact, later, the district attorney's office was asked if they planned to question Nicole about the data suggesting that she was aware of Chris and Shanann for up to a year before the murders. They asked if they were going to look a into those year? searches and to some of her text history. And the DA said that Chris's guilty plea precluded any need to further probe the results of that forensic analysis of her phone. Basically, if they got their guy, there was no need to investigate further and they could close the case. No, and then he keep doing it. That this is actually why Nicole's father kept asking if Chris confesses, it'll be the end of the case, right? And also many suggest and suspect that that's why Chris confessed so quickly after he failed the polygraph test so that he could essentially save Nicole from being implicated. So now let's talk more about the red flags mm. according to the evidence that is outlined in the 2,000 pages. I like of this girl's channel. And that ties back to parts of this interview. First and foremost, Nicole has no alibi for the time of the murders. Zip, zilch, zero. And she didn't clock into work until 3 p.m. that day. And not only did she not clock in until 3 p.m., but her activity while she was at work for a short period of time was kind of sketchy. But we'll get to that in a minute. Let's okay. start with the morning of the murders. The morning of the murders, a neighbor reported seeing a truck very similar to the one that Nicole owned. And the neighbor says that she saw it outside the Watts home. At that same time that this neighbor saw the truck, Nicole's phone pinged a tower in Frederick, Colorado, where the Watts family home was. Oh and it pinged at 6.16 a.m. Which Nicole is what he was doing. Was 25 minutes away. And what's interesting is when they FaceTimed the night earlier for that 111 minute FaceTime, it pinged at her house, not in Frederick. What? So if it was an error ping or an accident, why wouldn't that FaceTime have also pinged closer to Chris's house and not at the same location this is that nuts. her phone always pings when she's at her house? And here is why I also believe that she was near Chris's home that morning. So that ping happened at 6.16 a.m. Now, she didn't make any other calls that day until 2.26 p.m. that afternoon. However, She's freaking her out. entire phone history was in the discovery. And when you analyze it, I went through it page okay. by page, line by line. When you analyze her phone history, you can see that every single day she makes at least one phone call per hour. She never has a gap like she did on that day from 6 a.m. to she's 2 freaking p.m. Out. without making any calls. That, along with no alibi, leads me to believe it's because she knew that she messed up by using her phone that morning and then stopped for the remainder of the day until she got to her office around 2 p.m. Because her phone shows that the next call took place at 2.26 p.m., which is right before she made two other calls from her office at 2.28 so p.m. So eight-hour difference, almost. PM which we also will talk about more here shortly. In addition to that, I decided to look further into her phone records to say, okay, could it just be a fluke? Maybe it did just coincidentally ping there. Maybe it was an error. So I looked at her phone records all the way until mid-September, over a month later, and never once did her phone ping again in that same area as it did the morning of the murder. So it's at not a 6, fluke! a.m. So what are the chances of it never pinging there again if it truly was a tech error or accident? It seems more likely that it never pinged there again because she, in fact, never went to the Watts house again. Something else that doesn't sit right with me is that Chris and Nicole met at Anadarko, the same place where Chris went to hide the bodies of his wife and children that morning. And as a safety officer, Nicole knew tons of information about these sites the sites that Chris worked at and the sites that he went to to dispose of their bodies. So it is absolutely possible that she helped him as he plotted all of this with where to go to dispose of the bodies. Why as would you put them in Nicole oil tanks? Has no alibi for that morning. All we know about is the phone ping that morning and that she did clock out of work at 3 p.m. right after making two phone calls from the office, one at 2.28 p.m. and another at 2.35 p.m. And those phone calls were to her spiritual advisor, a 73-year-old man named Robert of the Ordo Templi Orientis. And one of the major features and core teachings of this organization that her spiritual advisor is, you know, is part of and that she called that day 
is the practice of sex magic. And similar to many Say what? societies, the membership is based on an initiation system with a series of degree ceremonies that use some sort of ritual drama. Now guys, it's real. Look it up. And there are a lot of theories on why these calls were made and this I heard she was a way, witch. way deeper, like she... but again, I'm not trying to go down that path as I'm trying. I heard that she was into like dark ritual stuff and then and she had book on magics and stuff like that. And that's why I was like, I need to look into this. To keep this video as little as conspiracy theory as okay. possible. But there are a lot of theories as to why she made those calls. And again, that's kind of just running deeper. So after those calls, she then immediately leaves the Anna Darko office and went to meet her friend Jim at her apartment at approximately 3.45. Who's Jim? At 5.01 p.m., Nicole calls Chris twice, but both calls are unanswered and she deletes the calls from her phone log. At 5.30 p.m., Chris calls Nicole. This call also goes unanswered and she deletes it from her phone log. Now here is where things begin to get a little suspicious in my opinion. It's already! The call history between the two of them then seems to seem more as though they are plotting and aligning stories now that the news has officially broken, rather than just two lovers who are innocent talking about what's going on. At 11.09 p.m., and again this was the night of the murders after Shanann has been reported as missing, there was a 51 minute phone call between the two of them. But then it was deleted from her phone. Eight minutes That's... later, at 12.09 a.m., Chris calls Nicole back for another 31 minutes. Then at 1.12 a.m., Nicole calls Chris back again and they talk for three minutes. Then at 1.51 a.m., Chris calls Nicole again. They talk for another eight minutes. So why are they going back and forth so much and calling each other? It feels like something's off. Almost as though Something's they're saying, going on. Yeah, we're, they're talking about something and then they're like, okay, yeah, like, let me do this really quick or let me look at this. I'll call you right back. Hang up. Call you. Hey, so here's what I'm thinking. Da, da, da. Call, hey, I'm calling you. Because why would they call back and forth like four or five times rather than just have one consistent conversation? Exactly. Something just feels off. Now, here comes the critical phone exchange okay. that leads me to believe that Nicole was involved somehow or knew more than she was letting on. After that exchange of phone calls, at 1.58 a.m., Chris and the detective play phone tag, and the detective says, and this is all in the discovery, that every time he tried to call and connect to Chris's phone, his personal phone would have dead air on his line. So then Chris would call him back, there would be dead air. He'd call Chris back, there would be dead air. Like something just wasn't connecting. So this goes on for nearly 10 minutes. Then Chris takes a break in calling the detective back for just one minute and he calls Nicole. Why take a break to call Nicole when you and the detective are clearly trying to connect? So he calls Nicole quickly from that same phone, from his personal phone. How long is that? And they talk for less than one minute. Then one minute later at 2.07 a.m., Chris calls the detective back, but this time he calls from his work phone, not his personal phone. And at that exact same time that he called the detective, Nicole calls Chris's personal phone. That call on the personal phone and the phone on Chris's work phone with the detective both lasted for 11 minutes, and it was the final call between Chris and Nicole. Because he had a speaker. Now, suspected, and this is outlined in the discovery, that the dead air between the phone tag phone calls from the detective and Chris was really Chris trying to add Nicole in as a listener to uh -huh. the three-way call, and that it wasn't connecting, which is why he then quickly called Nicole for one minute or less to tell her that it wasn't working and that he was going to let her listen on speaker instead. <laughs> he at her and then calls the detective from his work phone one minute later. She calls his personal phone at the same time to listen to the oh, conversation. Oh, I, I feel like she's 100% the in there now. is all outlined in the discovery, guys. I am not making this up. Do we know that she listened to their conversation for a fact? No, which is probably why nothing could be used because a lot of this is still just circumstantial. Oh evidence. my gosh, what man. What else could have been the reason for him to have her on his personal phone simultaneously while he's talking to the detective on his work phone? How do you make that up? For the exact same amount of time. Oh my gosh, this girl's good. In addition good. to the deleted calls on Nicole's phone, there were hours worth of searches for Shanann Watts. And after the murders, Nicole deleted every single search. That's so suspicious. So, did she delete them because she wanted to look like she truly did write Chris off and didn't care about anything pertaining to him? Why delete them if you're just curious about updates in the case and have nothing to hide? 
especially if you're trying to act so forthcoming to police. Exactly. Nicole also tried to destroy her SIM card before she gave her phone to investigators. She also deleted texts and photos of Chris and her, as well as her total search history. A search history which shows her looking to see if the cops could be able to trace those text messages, read deleted text messages. If you can't tell me that she was not involved, that is gaka, okay? She's deleting stuff. She's destroying SIM cards or trying to do that. She's looking up things. You cannot tell me for a point now that this Nicole Kessinger was not involved in some shape or form. Did she choke Shanann? No. But she was there. Her phone pinged off the tower, okay? She was there the day that they were killed. I have no doubt about it that that girl was there. How much you want to bet? And how long phone companies stored text messages for. It's like two years, I think. Things that doesn't sit right with me in all of this case is how Nicole plays both the victim and also the martyr. For the victim role, at first she tells detectives that Chris told her that he and Shanann were separated and that they were in the process of divorcing, that she had no idea they were still married she and knew, had a baby on the way. Yet, if he, she truly did think this, then why would she be Googling things like, man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife? A search that she made on July 24th. Wedding. If you thought that they were in fact separated Presses. or mutually divorcing, you wouldn't be using the word affair and you wouldn't be using the word mistress. Not to mention that Father's Day post that we discussed earlier. She could have seen certainly it. Certainly would have informed her that they were not separated. No one looking at Shanann's Facebook page would ever be under the impression that she was nearing the end of a mutual divorce, as Nicole claimed to believe. Now, sure. Being the other woman hardly implicates you in murder. But if you're lying about what you understood his marriage status to be, when there are several things... And you're deleting stuff? You have to ask why. Aside from the shame of being the mistress, why would you lie so blatantly about those things? Then, as for the martyr role, she told detectives that ultimately she encouraged Chris to work things out with his family right before he took that trip to North Carolina. So... You know, but then being in a house, I was just like, why? Fix this. Find a way to fix this. Make it work, you know? And, and I, would, I, would, I was, like, trying to push him to do it, and he seemed pretty reluctant to do it. He didn't want to. And, he wanted um, to be with her. I don't know. We were still seeing each other fairly frequently, but I kind of, like, backed away so we weren't hanging out quite as much and we were still close it just seemed like he had so much going on i've seen the pictures of you too it's just beautiful that i was like why don't you just try this out you know and see if you can fix it and he'd always be like well what about us what about us i'm like don't worry about us like that is more important like try to see if you can like salvage whatever it is that you have going on with your wife and and you know he I always got the impression that he was a great father to his kids, like always. Yeah, and so a great father murders like, their kids. He's the dad that you want to be. I was like, see if you can make it work. And then she says that he told her that he was going to go to North Carolina and try to work on his marriage and give it another shot. It didn't so work. she says he was going to give it another shot. I encouraged him to do so. So then I decided to give him space to do that, trying to look like she's the bigger person, saying I really wanted him to try to fix his family, fix his marriage. He said he would go to North Carolina and try, so I gave him the space to do that. And then um, he told me that, uh, oh, he went to... Um, there she goes, look at the camera again. North Carolina. And he was like, I'm going to talk to her when I'm in North Carolina and see if I can get her to do this, to like try to like rekindle the flame. Now, if this were true, guys... Why would she be Googling things like marrying your mistress and spending over two hours looking at wedding dresses? She Googled those things on the 4th of August and the 8th of August while Chris was in North Carolina and according to her, she was giving him space to try and fix the marriage. If you're giving him space to try to fix the marriage and encouraging him to fix the marriage, then why, and he's telling you he's gonna fix the marriage, then why are you looking up wedding dresses? Why are you Googling marrying your mistress? 
It doesn't make sense. That is so and I suspicious. I believe that she knew from day one that Chris was married and that she was the mistress and that was her role. I don't think she ever thought that they were in the process of separating or that they were She ever liked going to be to the other woman. Marriage. Now, in an, another interesting piece of information, Chris eventually told law enforcement that he tried to first subdue Shanann with Oxycontin. And the police yep, I did weren't hear that able to ever establish to kill how the baby. he got the Oxycontin as it was never prescribed to him. And he told them that where the Oxycontin came from is a secret that he... Don't tell me that Nicole had the Oxycontin that she was prescribed and she gave it to Chris. That's what I'm hearing. That I, that's why I have a feeling that something's coming up from that. ...will take to the grave. Now, call logs show that Nicole was once on the phone with Chris then on the phone with a clinic, then on the phone with Chris again. And when transcripts were pulled from that clinic she called, it showed that she was inquiring about how much Oxycontin would be safe to take and how much would cause a miscarriage. Interesting. Now, maybe this doesn't indicate that she was involved in the murder itself, but to me, it does prove that she knew that Shanann was pregnant before that newspaper and before the interview. How can interview, you not get in trouble for before, researching she that? She said she had absolutely no idea until it was all over the news. It Bull. is also suspected that while in North Carolina, after Chris joined his family there, that he may have tried to secretly give Shanann that drug to induce a miscarriage because Shanann became very ill one day and was complaining of severe cramps. So one theory out there is that Nicole and Chris had hoped to induce a miscarriage so that he could then divorce her easier. But then when that didn't work, the plan was escalated. So when Chris came back from North Carolina, he and Nicole picked up right where they left off. And then on August 12th, they went on that infamous date to the Lazy Dog where everything really blew up because Shanann saw the charge for dinner. Yep, I remember that. card statement. For and two. Knew that the total bill was more than it would cost. It was like $111. And he's like, why would you? So Shanann was like, well, why would you go to a place like that and rack up $111 just yourself? So she already knew something was going on for just one person but before hitting the town to get something to eat nicole spent 45 minutes googling how to prepare for butt sex what and the butt sex guide and this was in addition to looking at videos of threesomes on certain sites and searching double penetration now we have to talk about the footage Actual and crap. people suspecting that Nicole was there that night and actually helped Chris. Although it is just speculation, so many people have been talking about this for years. So I felt like I did need to touch on it briefly in okay. this video. As people analyze the footage from the neighbor's camera, many strongly believe that Nicole can be seen in this footage. So let me- Hold on. So they're saying the top image the two on the left is Nicole wearing jeans, a black shirt, and Ugg boots, okay? Now, Nicole was thinner woman. Um, Shanann was obviously a thicker woman because she's a mother. She's also pregnant with um, Nico, the unborn child. But then you look at the other guy that's at the bottom, black shirt, jeans and white shoes okay that is two different people let me just show you a quick glimpse of this hey guys i didn't want to do another chris watts video but i felt that this was really important i saw this in a facebook group and it comes from the surveillance of the neighbor's house that morning if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that that person seems to have breasts. Also, they seem to have long hair. Here is another photo. It's not very clear. What? Here is an outline of that photo. It shows a purse on the back of that person. Looks familiar. Oh! Hold on. Okay. I got, I got, I'm not excited. I'm just like flabbergasted with all this new information, okay? Are you kidding me? How much more evidence could you get? Let me play that for you one more time. Hey guys, I didn't want to do another Chris Watts video, but I felt that this was really important. I 
saw this in a Facebook group, and it comes from the surveillance of the neighbor's house that morning. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see that that person seems to have breasts. Yep. Also, they seem to have long hair. Here is another photo. It's not very clear. But She's holding something. Here's an outline of that photo. It shows a purse on the back of that person. Looks familiar. Holy snakes. Now, true. It would certainly align with Nicole's phone pinging near the Watts home that morning. It would also explain why she never clocked into work and why she... Because she was helping with the murders. ...for that morning. So on August 19th, the day after this police interview, Nicole starts to Google all about Amber Fry, who Amber was the, the killed her daughter. Scott Peterson, who was also Wait, convicted of one. killing his wife and unborn child. And Nicole was Googling if people hate Amber, how much money Amber made from the book deal she got, among other things. So it's my belief that at this point, she realized that she and Chris were not going to get away with this and live happily ever after together. So she was then wondering how she could benefit from the situation and really make the most of it for herself. Nicole has never been charged or formally named as a person of interest, although so many people in the arena firmly believe that she was involved in this to some degree. Based on everything we have learned about this case so far, what is your opinion? I'm really curious to know. Do you think that she was more involved or knew more than she's letting on? Or do you think that she really was the innocent mistress in all of this and Chris Watts played her and she was blindsided? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Again, I'm making a promise to myself that this is my last trip to Watts Island. I highly doubt new information is going to surface, but if it does, maybe I'll rethink that. But this case, I mean, I just am trying to stay away from it because it can become a circus very quickly. And there are just so many conspiracy theories out there. But I am really curious to know what your thoughts are. I still firmly, firmly believe at the very least that she knew something was going to happen or that this was the plan. Because if she didn't, why else would she listen in on that phone call between him and the detective unless she, it was trying to assess She's what, on tape. Knew, what he was saying? It makes absolutely no sense. Why would her phone ping? Why would she delete history? She's why on she CCTV. Why would she say she didn't know Shanann's name when she really did? There are just way, way too many inconsistencies, in my opinion, for her not to have been involved. Now, all of those inconsistencies, even the ones that are outlined as evidence. Can't be used as evidence, can it? Are circumstantial. There is enough for reasonable doubt there, which is my belief as to why she has not formally been charged. Yes. Although others speculate it's because, you know, her dad runs deep and that could be why. Again, another conspiracy so theory. Paid possibly off. true. Who knows? But at the end of the day, the evidence of her truly being involved in the crime itself isn't there. It's all circumstantial about her location, her knowing the site in which the bodies were disposed of, her listening in, any everything that can't prove that she was directly tied. But I believe she was. So let me know what you guys think. And let me know what you do think, if you do think she was involved. Let me know what you think her level of involvement was. I'm curious to know. Did she help that night with the murders, help dispose of the bodies? Did she help with the cleanup, the cover-up? Because some suspect that she was at his house even that morning, cleaning things up and getting things in order, and that she was going to text from Shanann's phone to make it look as though Shanann had really just gone off with the girls and left Chris, but then that plan was foiled because Shanann changed her passcode, which we know was true in the oh body cam footage gosh. because Chris can't get into her phone. And then Shanann's friend says, it's your unborn child's birthday. And then he's like, oh. And then they get in. So people believe what that that plan was foiled because they couldn't get into her phone and that that's really why her phone was left behind to begin with, where he was so careful to get rid of everything else. So, again, so many theories on this case, but I'm interested to know what you think just regarding her involvement. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope... I'm 100% now confirmed and convinced that that woman, Nicole Kessinger, <coughs> was involved. <coughs> Excuse me. Did she kill them? No. But I feel she covered up with Chris in taking them out to the location, burying them, knowing where it was. Why would you delete messages? Why would you why would you delete things and 
and all these things that this woman on Ten to Life has brought up from the interrogations. Holy crap. Even seeing the CCTV video like that, the the purse, the one that the figure that looked like it had long hair and boobs. And I'm sorry, I'm 100% convinced now that Nicole Kessinger was involved in these murders. Again, like I said before, was she the one that was sitting there strangulation? No, I believe that was Chris. But when Chris did that, she came to help clean up the the, the process and make this try to be an accident or whatever have you, or she, we can't find her. This woman, with all this substantial evidence that this we see here, she should be charged with attempt of murder or or tampering with evidence or um she should be charged and she should have like 25 to 30 years in prison because she didn't cause the dr the deaths well mm -hmm. this woman should be charged and she should not be out there living her life which i read again she apparently was pregnant had a kid had a boy with another married man this woman can needs to be put away okay Comment your guys' thoughts down below. Let me know what you guys thought about this. I, Looking at these also, looking at the comments on this girl's page, the 10 to life, I'm seeing everybody stating that, yep, she's guilty. She's 100% guilty. She's going to hell. She's, I mean, every single, co there's no comment that states that this woman was, uh, what's it called? Um innocent there is no right that this woman was innocent i'm so pissed off now like i have the cctv is what sign like sign seal delivered that nail in the coffin seeing that woman that was on there you could see chris watts wearing jeans and white shoes and the black shirt the other one was wearing black boots like ugg boots jeans black shirt long hair and breasts that was her okay I'm a, I'm a hundred seal delivered that that was her. This girl did fantastic. Go to her channel. Make sure you guys give her some love. She is almost to a million subscribers. She has roughly 3000 to go to make herself a million. I would love to talk to her about this. Just to see. I mean, she said she's convinced that she had some part of this, but this woman, Nicole Kessinger needs to be exposed, needs to be put in prison for her connection with the Watts murders. Because I feel that she's involved. So, comment your guys' thoughts. Let me know. Uh, definitely hit the like button just for the video. Because you believe that um, Nicole is uh, the participant in this. It's not to be like the video because of the, the, the problem that we're watching this for. The exposing. But, again... I can't believe it. So this is a good watch that I did. Thank you guys for referencing this video for me, letting me know about this because I'm definitely glad I watched it. So again, thank you guys for watching. I surely appreciate all of you guys. Don't forget to subscribe for more content, not just this stuff, but there's tons of nerdy stuff, um, scary stuff and more. So, and we'll see you guys in the next video. So keep it real, keep it safe. And as always, keep nerding on. We'll see you guys next time.